11. Austin Hayes A disturbing lawsuit filed in early 2023 is accusing former West Virginia delegate Austin Hayes of abusing his position to request favors from a woman in exchange for helping to get a bill passed. According to court filings, the woman, identified only as Jane Doe, was an unpaid lobbyist and citizen advocate who began working to pass a Native American tribal recognition bill in the state legislature in 2019. The complaint claims that Hayes began messaging her on Facebook that year, promising to pass the bill if he won the 2020 election. After securing his victory, Hayes and the woman exchanged phone numbers and began discussing the bill regularly. He never introduced it as promised, yet continued to make contact with Jane Doe. Hayes is accused of taking an intrusive tone with his correspondence starting in 2021, when he began asking the woman some personal questions. She avoided answering the questions and tried to redirect the conversation back to appropriate topics, but Hayes allegedly only came on stronger with his unwelcome statements. According to the official complaints, the plaintiff once again avoided answering, and Hayes apologized to her the following day. The woman claimed that he escalated his behavior into late-night phone calls and that he would sit silently on the other end when she answered. Based on reports from the West Virginia record, Hayes messaged Jane Doe the next day, claiming that he wasn't encouraging her to sleep around in order to get the bill passed, but that he was making her aware of what happens sometimes. The lawsuit alleges that he abused his position and continued to harass the woman, even after she clearly tried to keep their interactions professional. The accusations against Hayes first came to light during his 2022 re-election bid, which he ended up losing after more women came forward with similar allegations. 10. J. Brett Blanton A damning report that was released by the U.S. architect of the Capitol's Inspector General's office in late 2022 revealed that one of its own had habitually abused his position, misused government property, and wasted taxpayer dollars for at least a two-year period. The findings came to light after a complaint from a civilian prompted the agency to launch an investigation against architect of the Capitol, J. Brett Blanton, in 2021. According to the caller, someone behind the wheel of an official AOC vehicle drove recklessly in a parking garage in Vienna, Virginia, reaching speeds of up to 65 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour zone. Investigators discovered that the vehicle was being driven by Blanton's daughters, which constituted unauthorized use, and that it apparently wasn't an isolated incident. The report alleged that Blanton and his family regularly used AOC vehicles for personal errands and weekend trips as far away as Florida, receiving at least $12,000 worth of unentitled benefits in the form of transportation, gas, and other costs. Even more shockingly, Blanton was accused of misrepresenting himself as a law enforcement official by activating the lights and siren on his vehicle. After a fender bender in 2021, he allegedly identified himself as an agent to the other driver involved in the crash and said that he didn't have insurance information, but that the government would handle the claim. On another occasion, witnesses claimed that Blanton chased a car using his AOC vehicle's emergency equipment after it hit his daughter's boyfriend's car in front of the family home. A police report listed him as an off-duty DC cop, and he continued with court proceedings without correcting the misconception that he was a police officer. The agency that conducted the report declined to press charges and referred the findings to other government agencies for any recourse they might want to take. 9. Mary O'Connor Tampa Police Chief Mary O'Connor and her husband were riding their golf cart without a license plate one evening when they were approached by Pinellas County Deputy Larry Jacoby. During their conversation with the deputy, O'Connor asked him if his body cam was recording prompting Jacoby to confirm that it was. O'Connor then quickly flashed her badge and identified herself as the Tampa police chief, then said, I'm hoping you'll just let us go tonight. The deputy let the pair go. Before parting ways, however, O'Connor handed Jacoby her card and said, call me if you ever need anything, seriously. She likely wasn't expecting people to find out about the incident, but they did and she admitted that her way of handling things could be viewed as inappropriate. In a statement, O'Connor said that she'd express great remorse to the mayor, and she apologized to Tampa's residents for her poor judgment. 
She further added that she didn't mean to put the deputy in an uncomfortable position and offered to pay any citations that her mistakes warranted. O'Connor requested the same discipline that any officer would receive for similar conduct. But her remorse wasn't enough to fix the situation, and O'Connor ultimately resigned from her position. 8. Dennis Baptista After receiving a call from a concerned motorist about an erratic driver one evening in 2014, New Jersey State Trooper Josh Ledeo spotted a vehicle matching the description the caller had provided. He followed the car and noticed that it was drifting between lanes, so he conducted a traffic stop. In a recorded conversation, Ledeo could be heard asking the driver, later identified as Phillipsburg Municipal Court Judge Dennis Baptista, if he'd been drinking that evening. Baptista told the trooper that he was a lawyer on his way home from work and that he hadn't had anything to drink. According to court documents, Ledeo noticed a distinct odor of alcohol on the driver's breath. During a field sobriety test, he observed other possible signs of intoxication, including slurred speech, slow movements, and glassy eyes. Baptista allegedly lost his balance and had to lean on his vehicle to stay on his feet at multiple points throughout the test. An audio recording of the interaction revealed that Baptista repeatedly asked Ledeo if they were past the point of the trooper being able to decide against arresting him. He also mentioned that he's a public figure and how a DUI charge would hurt him more than the average guy. But it was Baptista's decision to drive drunk and to mention that he's a judge that really hurt him, not Trooper Ledeo's decision to arrest him for appearing to be intoxicated. Baptista ultimately pleaded guilty to DUI and was also disciplined for using his position to advance his private interests, which goes against the state's judicial code of conduct. He was censured or issued a written reprimand for his professional misconduct and was barred from hearing DUI cases for a year. The judge also revoked Baptista's driving license for three months and ordered him to attend drunk driving classes on top of paying a penalty. 7. Peter Leckie In 2022, authorities in British Columbia announced charges against Royal Canadian Police Corporal Peter Leckie for an alleged history of misconduct dating back nearly seven years. A Surrey RCMP complaint claims that Leckie used his position as a police officer to obtain information about members of the public who he contacted both on and off duty for the purpose of engaging in intimate relationships. The original charges, which included assault, computer fraud, and breach of trust, were connected to three victims and spanned a time period lasting from early 2014 to October 2020. Police then published Leckie's photo, with the expectation that more women might come forward. Several months later, a handful of new charges against him were announced, including assault, breach of trust, and fraudulently obtaining computer services. Lecky, who's been with the RCMP since 2010, remains suspended without pay pending the outcomes of the cases, which consist of 14 criminal charges in total. The exact circumstances surrounding his alleged crimes are unclear, as authorities have released few details to the public so far. In a statement, Surrey RCMP Assistant Commissioner Brian Edwards described the allegations against Leckie as disturbing and encouraged anyone else who may have been targeted to come forward, suggesting that the scandal may be far from over. 6. Vanessa Gibson In what began as a routine traffic stop one day in 2014, NYPD officer Michelle Hernandez pulled a female driver over in the Bronx for talking on her cell phone while behind the wheel. Hernandez was likely unaware, at least at the beginning of the interaction, that the driver was city councilwoman Vanessa Gibson. During the stop, Gibson called Deputy Inspector Kevin Catalina, the commanding officer of the 44th Precinct, who instructed a desk officer to tell Hernandez not to issue a ticket. When Hernandez returned to Gibson's car, she handed the officer her phone. Catalina reportedly instructed the cop to issue a verbal warning rather than write a ticket and reminded her that Gibson was the head of the Public Safety Committee. Hernandez complied, and the ticket against Gibson was voided, but the situation made her uncomfortable enough to keep a copy of the cancelled citation. The city charter dictates that elected officials should be held to a higher standard of compliance with the law, and it forbids them from using their position for personal advantage. 
Hernandez mentioned the incident in a lawsuit accusing the NYPD of unlawful performance goals that she claimed required her to perform excessive arrests and searches. While the lawsuit was dismissed, the allegation against Gibson stuck. She denied explicitly asking Catalina not to issue a ticket, but admitted that she should have just accepted the summons and handled the situation like every other civilian is expected to when they get caught breaking a traffic law. As a result, Gibson was fined $5,000 for trying to avoid the ticket, which was a violation that comes with a maximum $50 fine and five license points for first-time offenders. 5. Carter Williams West Virginia Circuit Judge C. Carter Williams was on his way home from a family outing to get ice cream one day in 2021 when Moorfield Police Officer Dear Vonta Johnson pulled him over for having his cell phone in his hand while driving. According to charging documents that were later filed against Williams, he angrily asked Officer Johnson why he was being stopped. The first time Johnson asked the judge for his license, registration, and insurance, Williams allegedly said he'd done nothing wrong. So, the officer asked for the documents again, and Williams outright said that he wasn't going to hand them over. He eventually gave Johnson the documents, though, after commenting on how he sees police officers using their phones behind the wheel all the time, something Johnson said they were allowed to do when it was related to their job duties. At some point, the cop asked Williams why he was so uptight, and the judge said it was because he'd been pulled over for no reason. While Johnson was running the license, which he soon realized had expired months earlier, Williams called Moorfield Police Lieutenant Melody Burrows, who was off duty at the time. Burrows radioed Johnson and told him not to write a ticket. As the officer returned to the vehicle and tried to tell Williams that his license was expired, the judge allegedly grabbed his documents out of the cop's hat and drove off. Later that evening, Williams called Moorfield Police Chief Stephen Riggleman and said he was tired of being disrespected. Riggleman, however, told the judge that if anyone was being disrespectful, it was him. Williams ultimately hung up on the police chief and proceeded to call the former police chief, Steve Reckart, who reminded Williams that he'd retired. The disgruntled judge said that he needed someone to talk to, which Reckart reportedly found odd because they weren't close friends. The night finally ended after Williams made yet another call to Lieutenant Burroughs and berated the police force, saying he'd never been treated so poorly. He then drove to the local mayor's house, where he administered another irrationally angry diatribe. An ensuing investigation uncovered an alleged pattern of Williams using his position to get away with violating traffic laws. Prior incidents included running a stop sign, driving with an expired registration, and not having a seatbelt fastened. A judicial hearing board recommended a three-month unpaid suspension and a $5,000 fine, along with orders for Williams to pay $11,000 in case-related costs. It also suggested extending the suspension for up to a year if Williams violates the conditions put forth by the terms of the agreement. 4. Nancy Cantor Rutgers University Newark Chancellor Nancy Cantor was on her way to Newark Liberty International Airport one day in 2019 when her driver hit a parked campus police car. Footage from the ensuing conversation with law enforcement appeared to show a cop struggling to explain to Cantor that he had to take information about the accident, saying, we have to do our job, just like you have to do your job. When an officer asked to see her ID, she argued that she wasn't driving instead of just handing it over. At one point during the video, Cantor could be heard saying, If I miss my plane, you folks are in trouble. I'm the chancellor. She then said that she would love to see them do that to the school's president. Another staff member instructed the officer to take a picture and let her go, adding, Would you do this to the president of the United States? No, no, you wouldn't. After the clip was leaked several months later, Cantor apologized to the Rutgers University Police Department for her behavior after the fender bender, stating that she wasn't her best self that day. She then expressed gratitude to the department for keeping the campus and community safe and secure. The police department and campus officials accepted Cantor's apology and seemed perfectly happy to just move on from the situation, sparing her from any serious repercussions. Perhaps the leaked footage of her embarrassing behavior was punishment enough. 3. Sarah Louise Johnston 
when 50-year-old off-duty police sergeant Sarah Louise Johnston encountered a random breathing test or RBT site in Sydney, Australia in 2016. She asked the rookie officers running the stop if they were really going to test her. They recognized who she was but had no plans to treat her differently from any other civilian who passed through the checkpoint. Johnston allegedly tried to tell one of the officers that breath-testing her would be a conflict of interest, adding, imagine if I blew over, which I won't. She was also later accused of telling the young cop that it would put him in an awkward situation. The two officers manning the checkpoint reported Johnston's misconduct, and she was held criminally responsible for her actions. Throughout the case, it came to light that she'd been out celebrating the new year with two colleagues and was driving home after drinking at least one glass of beer. In court, one of the officers who dealt with Johnston during the stop said that he felt manipulated by his higher-ranking colleague and that her behavior came across as a little aggressive. He also explained that the way Johnston acted made him second-guess himself and believe that he was wrong for subjecting her to a random test. Regardless of whether or not Johnston was drunk, the judge said she set a disgraceful example as someone who's expected to be an honest and upstanding member of the community. He also told Johnston that she brought shame upon herself and to all honest members of the police force, and he commended the officers who reported her for coming forward. Johnston was found guilty of using her position and rang to avoid being breath tested and was sentenced to 16 months in jail with the requirement to spend at least a year behind bars before becoming eligible for parole. 2. Karen Z. Turner After serving as a financial advisor to Hillary Clinton, Karen Z. Turner became a commissioner with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. She also served as a chairwoman of the agency's ethics committee. Her previously impeccable professional record was blemished in April 2018, when she was called to help resolve a matter between police in Tenafly, New Jersey, and her daughter, who was apparently unable to provide proof of insurance or registration when she was pulled over. Cringe-worthy body cam footage showed Turner demanding details about the traffic stop that the police politely told her they weren't required to provide since her daughter and everyone else in the car was over 18. In the video, Turner could be heard ordering the cops to call her Commissioner rather than Miss. Based on a police report, an officer advised her to speak with the driver of the car, her daughter, for the information she was seeking. The report further described Turner's conduct as attempting to misappropriately use her professional position to gain authority in this situation. An officer tried to end the conversation, at which point Turner told him to shut the F up. She then warned him that she would be speaking with the local mayor about the incident. Afterward, someone alerted the Port Authority to the situation, prompting an investigation to be launched. Instead of waiting to learn the outcome, Turner resigned from her position. In a statement, a Port Authority spokesperson described her actions as indefensible and said that the agency has zero tolerance for ethics violations. The same ethics committee that Turner used to be the leader of then censured her for outrageous and profoundly disturbing conduct. By then, she'd already left her position, but the symbolic gesture will hopefully serve as an example to other high-ranking Port Authority officials about how this type of behavior won't be tolerated. Chairman Kevin O'Toole said that if Turner hadn't resigned, the board would have demanded for her to step down. 1. Steve Marks In early 2023, the Associated Press got its hands on an internal investigation report from the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission, which found that its director, Steve Marks, and five of his top deputies used their position to obtain highly coveted bourbon that members of the public compete for the opportunity to purchase in a state-run lottery. The bottles, which can cost thousands of dollars each and include 23-year-old Pappy Van Winkle whiskey, were diverted to Marks and his colleagues, depriving other paying customers of the opportunity to buy the upscale booze. The investigation ruled that the suspects abused their positions and violated state statutes, including a policy that bans public officials from using confidential information for personal gain. Oregon Governor Tina Kotek called for the removal of Marx and the other officials who were implicated in the scandal, describing their behavior as wholly unacceptable. Marx denied violating ethics laws and state policies, 
but acknowledged that he received some level of preferential treatment in obtaining the whiskey. He and the co-accused officials denied ever reselling the bottles. Before the findings were uncovered, Governor Kotek had already asked Marks to step down from his position as part of her bid to reorganize state agency leadership. In accordance with her request, he submitted his resignation letter after the scandal broke. Kotek has since called for the firing of any top-level managers within the Liquor Commission who sought preferential treatment in their attempts to obtain liquor. Number 11. Kayla Massa On February 13, 2020, federal authorities in New Jersey apprehended Kayla Massa. You may also know Kayla as at Kay Goldie, or you would if you were one of her 300,000 private Instagram followers. The reason Kayla was arrested was that according to unsealed documents from a New Jersey federal court, she was the orchestrator of a scheme. Her scheme involved scamming 45 of her followers on social media out of over $1.5 million. Most of the victims of Kayla's scam were under the age of 18. Here's how the scam unfolded. Kayla posted photographs of money orders and huge stacks of cash to her Instagram stories. These stories made it appear as though Kayla were rich. The stories also came with instructions for her followers to empty their bank accounts and provide Kayla with their debit cards and their PIN numbers. This way, the victims would supposedly be unable to lose any money while giving Kayla access to their accounts. The reason they would give Kayla access to their accounts was because they thought she was going to give them money. It was all a huge ruse to use their accounts for fraudulent activity. Kayla, once in possession of the debit card and the PIN number, would allegedly deposit a huge fraudulent check. She would then withdraw the cash from her victim's bank account before the bank realized anything was wrong. By the time the bank and her victims figured out she had tricked them, her victims were stuck with a huge bill and being accused by the bank of committing fraud. When they reached out to Kayla, she blocked her victims on social media and then used the money she stole to buy luxury cars and clothes. Kayla is currently accused of these crimes and has been charged, but there is yet to be a verdict. Kayla allegedly worked with nine co-conspirators, but it's been over two years and nothing definitive has happened yet. Number 10. Mark D'Amico and Caitlin McClure In 2019, Mark D'Amico from New Jersey pled guilty for organizing a cruel, cruel scam on the public. He and his girlfriend at the time, Caitlin McClure, conspired to earn themselves some money by appealing to the public's sense of goodness. They were the ones behind the GoFundMe scam, raising $400,000 by tricking people into thinking the money was going to be donated to a homeless veteran. Instead, the money went to Mark and Caitlin. A little chunk of change went to the homeless man, but it was all a big charade. The incident itself occurred in 2017. Mark and Caitlin created the GoFundMe account after she allegedly ran out of gas near the interstate in Philadelphia. When she ran out of gas, she bumped into a man named Johnny Bobbitt, according to their original story. The homeless veteran only had $20 to his name, but he used it to pay for her fuel. It was such a heartwarming story that they earned almost half a million bucks through the campaign. The original goal was $10,000, so they clearly blew way past that. 14,000 people donated out of the goodness of their hearts, but it was all a lie. 14,000 people thought they were doing a good deed. In reality, they were paying for casino gambling, a new BMW, a trip to Las Vegas for New Year's, Louis Vuitton handbags, and a casual helicopter ride over the Grand Canyon. That's only some of the things the money was spent on, according to the prosecutor's office. Things turned sour in 2018 when Johnny, the homeless man, filed a lawsuit against the couple. He accused them of withholding the funds and only offering him a measly $75,000. That wasn't even a quarter of the money they made through the campaign. They stiffed the one guy who could sell them out, and so that was exactly what he did. Mark got five years in prison, and Caitlin got one year. They were also ordered to pay back all the money to GoFundMe. Number 9. Sarah Disley Five years after masterminding a sophisticated scheme to earn herself nearly $600,000, Sarah Disley was arrested. The former St. George bank worker supposedly used her position at the bank to steal money, transfer it into multiple fake accounts, and then spend that money herself. Following her arrest in December of 2020, she was seen in tears, crying because she would spend Christmas locked up in jail 
and away from her two sons. When bail was denied in a central local court, Sarah practically had a meltdown. This all happened in Australia, and it started in 2016. The court heard allegations that Sarah began her crime spree by stealing driver's licenses from people in New South Wales and Victoria. Then she used their details to create fake bank accounts where she worked, leaving herself in full control of all the accounts. The court then heard from Constable Brendan Kitchener about how Sarah was the one behind the whole thing, and that she had two patsies working under her, both of whom have also been arrested. When Sarah was initially arrested, she was loaded into the back of a police van wearing a grey onesie and designer gold slides. As she stepped into the holding cell in the van, Sarah muttered, ew, and luckily for her, she didn't have to spend much time behind bars. She was allowed out on a bond of $1.5 million shortly after her arrest. In 2022, she was brought up on 237 charges, most involving dishonestly gaining a financial advantage by deception. Even with all the charges, Sarah is currently free and waiting for the case to end. She's either going to be allowed to remain free, or she'll spend a significant amount of time locked in a cell. Number 8. The Nigerian Prince you may have heard about the legendary Nigerian Prince email scam. These were huge scams that appeared in the early days of email. People all over the world were receiving messages from an alleged Nigerian prince or high official who had too much money and wanted to give some of it away. And while there were probably quite a few Nigerian prince scammers out there, one of them was busted recently in Louisiana. In December of 2017, Michael New was arrested in connection to a scam in which he wired money on behalf of a fake Nigerian official with a fake inheritance. Michael was facing 269 counts of wire fraud and money laundering. The investigation into Michael was a long one, spanning over 18 months according to the Slidell Police Department in Louisiana. Michael was not the head of the Nigerian Prince scamming organization, only a middleman. He was responsible for obtaining money from scam victims, then wiring that money to his co-conspirators, who live, believe it or not, in Nigeria. Here's the way the scam went according to the Federal Trade Commission. It all started with an email from an alleged Nigerian official in need of financial assistance. This fake official claimed to be on the brink of a huge inheritance but needed a bit of financial help to get it. And while a lot of people may laugh at the scam, after all it has been an international joke for years, people do still fall victim to it. The scam is a serious crime and the victims are real, warm-blooded humans. Millions of dollars a year are lost to these Nigerian prince scams. It's not clear exactly how much money Michael made for his part in this scheme, but it's safe to say he won't be the last middleman to scam unsuspecting victims. Number 7. Billy McFarland Billy McFarland is the man behind the Fire Festival fraud. He was the brains behind the most infamous bad party in modern memory, and although he was supposed to be incarcerated until August of 2023, he's already out. Billy was placed into the residential re-entry management on March 30th, 2023. He's already allegedly planning another festival and even hiring out his consulting services online for $1,800 an hour. Billy has been out of jail for less than a month at the time this video was made, and he's already working toward another festival and trying to make some serious money. If you're a bit foggy on what happened with the Fire Festival, here's a recap. Billy McFarland organized the party music festival of the century alongside rapper Ja Rule. The party was billed as the ultimate luxury experience. It was supposed to be the biggest bash for Instagram influencers ever thrown. Millennials, influencers, party-hungry socialites, everyone was going to be there. The event was promoted by people like Kendall Jenner and Hayley Baldwin, who were paid for their support of the event. Everything on paper was good, but in reality, Billy was not a man to be trusted. He misled his investors and failed to deliver on every single thing he promised. There was a festival, yes, but it wasn't anything like it was supposed to be. In 2018, Billy told federal prosecutors he underestimated the resources required for producing an event of that magnitude. People spent thousands of dollars on tickets. They expected to watch Blink-182 and rub shoulders with celebrities. Instead, they found themselves stuck on an island in refugee tents filled with styrofoam boxes. Billy was sentenced to six years in federal prison, but only served four. Number 6. Kevin Trudeau 
In early 2023, TV fraudster Kevin Trudeau narrowly avoided returning to federal lockup for skipping a court date. And although the judge allowed him to stay out of jail, it might not last forever. U.S. authorities have demanded that Kevin start paying off his $37 million fine immediately. If he doesn't, he could be back behind bars. But who in the world is Kevin Trudeau anyway? He was the original fraud man, convicted in the early 1990s of larceny and credit card fraud. But he's most famous now for his late-night infomercials. He made a fortune selling everything from health and financial advice to people using late-night TV. He promoted books about how to lose weight, along with other sensitive subjects that Kevin may know very little about. In 2007, he was accused of misrepresenting the contents of one of his books. Just a few years before, Kevin had agreed to pay a fine of $500,000 and to stop marketing most of his products. It was agreed that he was swindling people out of their money by offering them essentially nothing of value and lying about his products. The only thing he was allowed to continue selling were his books because they were, and still are, protected under the First Amendment. He could have gotten away clean after making a huge fortune. Instead, Kevin continued to swindle people out of their money. In 2011, he was fined almost $40 million for violating the order given to him in 2004 to stop selling his products. And in 2013, the same thing happened. He claimed insolvency and filed for bankruptcy. This was despite FTC lawyers believing him to be hiding money in shell companies. The FTC cited Kevin spending almost $400 on a haircut as an example of him still being rich, something a bankrupt person probably wouldn't do. All that messing around caught up to Kevin in November of 2013. He was finally convicted of criminal contempt. Kevin was given 10 years in a federal prison and got an early release in 2022. But if he doesn't start paying off that fine, he could go back to jail. Number 5. Elizabeth Holmes Elizabeth Holmes was the CEO of Theranos. She enjoyed an unprecedented amount of wealth, which she earned by scamming people out of their money. But on April 27, 2023, Elizabeth Holmes will begin her 11-year prison sentence. She lost her bid to remain free. Elizabeth will now be spending the foreseeable future in a Texas minimum security prison camp. Let's take a deeper look at Elizabeth and figure out what she did. Those close to Elizabeth described her as intensely competitive from a young age. Even when she was just a little girl, she played Monopoly fiercely with her younger brother and her cousin. She would even insist on playing until the very end, collecting cash and properties until she was the master of Monopoly. And if she lost, she was one of those people who would flip the board. Elizabeth founded the company Theranos in 2003 at the age of 19. The company was something straight out of science fiction. Elizabeth promised her investors that they were creating extremely advanced proprietary technology. Their technology would allow blood tests to run using only a single pinprick of blood from a finger. Using the company's special tech, that single drop of blood would be able to detect all kinds of medical conditions, even cancer. She operated the company for a decade in almost complete secrecy, accepting money from backers but keeping the company in the shadows. Elizabeth was a sensation. She was hardly into her 20s and was already appearing on the cover of Forbes, Fortune and doing TED Talks. She and her family were making millions of dollars. In 2013, the company had a valuation of $10 billion. Then in 2015 came the investigations. Medical professionals and investigative journalists were starting to suspect Theranos was not doing anything. It turned out the company was a fraud. They didn't have any devices that could detect diseases. Every claim Elizabeth made was a lie. Her personal net worth dropped from $4.5 billion to practically zero. She had fun in her 20s, but she'll be spending the next decade in jail. Number 4. Yuse Rosello Torado in Michigan, Yusei Rosello Torado was facing charges for scamming people out of their money. Yusei is in his 40s and lives in Miami, but he was arrested in April of 2022 in Hazel Park when he tried to meet with a courier. According to the cops, the courier was collecting money from scam victims. Let's break it down from the very beginning. 
Police started their investigation when a senior citizen in Shelby Township received a mysterious call. The caller said her granddaughter was involved in an accident and could be in major trouble with the law. Money was needed for her granddaughter to get out of the legal pickle, otherwise it would be bad news. This is a fairly common scam in which somebody tries to frighten an elderly person into paying money to protect one of their grandchildren. But this time, the scammer met his match. When the courier went to the victim's house to pick up the money, the cops were ready. The courier was identified, and the cops intercepted the courier transferring the money to UC. Then the scammer was taken back to jail. The police found three other victims in the vicinity who had all been scammed at the same time, and luckily they were able to get their money back. It wasn't a very big scam, but big enough that UC made around $20,000 in cash from bullying senior citizens. Number 3. Ashok Jadeja Ashok Jadeja was able to swindle money from thousands of victims across India using what might seem like a rather unusual method. Ashok was a self-proclaimed godman, able to bestow blessings upon an individual for a little bit of money. He was notorious for sitting outside the Sukata Mati temple in the Indian state of Gujarat. Outside the temple, he would tell people that if they gave him money, the goddess Vahanvati Sukata Mata would make them wealthy. Ashok claimed to have divine powers. He would lure the weakest and most susceptible victims he could find into participating in a ritual. These people would have to contribute whatever they could, and then Ashok would pay back whatever they spent threefold. This allowed him to gain the trust of his victims and rip them off for even more money. He became so good at swindling religious believers out of their cash that he had 35 accomplices following his instructions. This might sound outrageous, but India is a deeply religious country. For somebody to say they are divine can go a fairly far distance, but to fake it can get you in big trouble. Ashok was arrested in 2009 along with his wife for scamming people. Only once in police custody did he finally admit to having no godly powers. Number 2. Charles Barry Charles Barry was the subway scammer who in 2020 was arrested for the 141st time. Charles was what we call a serial scammer. He made his living by tricking tourists in New York City into exchanging cash for an expired Metro card. Expired cards are easy enough to find, and tourists are generally easy enough to spot. During his most recent arrest, Charles targeted a 23-year-old tourist. He introduced himself as an MTA worker while the target was at the vending machine about to purchase a Metro card. Thinking she was dealing with a real agent, the tourist forked over $32 for a non-functioning card. By the time she realized she had been scammed, Charles Barry was long gone. But it didn't matter how far he went, the cops easily caught up to him. Seeing as he was already arrested 140 times for scamming people, the cops knew exactly who to look for. The 56-year-old was, and probably still is, notorious for trolling the subways as an expert con man. Even though he was facing charges of fraudulent accosting, Charles wasn't looking at any hard time in jail or any prolonged time away from the subway. Number 1. The Other Kayla Massa in the winter and spring of 2022, the Upper Merion Police Department received reports from local residents saying they had been the victims of a mail scam. People had their checks missing and couldn't seem to find their mail. As it turned out, four individuals were busy stealing mail, committing check fraud, and costing the residents of Upper Merion over $600,000. But probably the weirdest part of the story is that one of the individuals involved in the crime was named Kayla Massa. And no, she is not in any way connected to the Instagram celeb who also participated in an alleged scam and is named Kayla Massa. The scam involved stealing mail from U.S. Postal Service mailboxes, mailboxes in front of people's houses, and overnight drop boxes at the local USPS facility. Authorities say victims realized they had been duped when their checks never showed up, then were suddenly cashed somewhere else in Philadelphia or even in another state. Many of these checks were mailed by residents as payment for taxes, medical procedures, and other extremely important things. Imagine trying to pay your bill, only to have someone lift the check as it's in the mail and deposit it in their own bank account. 
It was brutal for the people of Upper Merion. Thankfully, the local police department has their own internet crime and technology unit, which led to the identification of the four suspects. Police arrested Devon Broughton, John Klotz, Kayla Massa, and Joshua Cruz. They were responsible for ripping off at least 51 victims, but the case is still ongoing. Number 10. Sherry Papini 34-year-old mother of two, Sherry Papini vanished in 2016 during a jog near her Redding, California home, leaving the community shocked and terrified. Her devastated husband, Keith, sobbed as he pleaded on national television for her safe return. Three weeks later, a truck driver found Sherry on the side of a highway hundreds of miles from her home. She was noticeably thin and covered in bruises, ligature marks, and other injuries. Sherry seemed extremely distressed and traumatized, which was understandable considering what she'd supposedly just been through. So law enforcement tried to be patient and understanding when she was reluctant to speak with investigators. When she finally began to tell her story, Sherry claimed that two masked Hispanic women abducted her at gunpoint during her jog. They forced her into an SUV and took her to an undisclosed location, where she was chained up, beaten, starved, and tortured at the hands of her captors, who also chopped her hair off and branded her. However, Sherry's story didn't add up, and the discrepancies became even more apparent as she continued to offer up more information. In the meantime, detectives became even less patient with Sherry as they began to poke holes in her story. Phone records turned up evidence that she may have cheated on Keith Papini, and male DNA found on Sherry's clothing turned up as a match to her ex-boyfriend, James Reyes. The woman's former partner eventually admitted that Sherry had convinced him to pick her up and take her to his home on the day she was supposedly kidnapped. Reyes said that Sherry claimed Keith was abusive and that he was unaware of her plan to stage her kidnapping. Over the next three weeks, she deliberately starved and injured herself in a bid to make her story believable once she made her reappearance. She also religiously followed the case on the news and was fully aware of the widespread worry and fear about her well-being. Reyes's claims checked out, and he was cleared of any wrongdoing. Authorities finally charged Sherry in connection with the case in 2022, and after standing by her for years, Keith filed for divorce. Sherry admitted to the hoax in exchange for an 18-month federal prison sentence and was fined $300,000 for needlessly wasting police and community resources. Number 9. Thelma Williams Residents in and around Hamilton, Ohio, were alarmed to log on to social media one day in 2017 and find photos and videos of a local woman named Thelma Williams in what appeared to be a brutal kidnapping. The images showed 38-year-old Williams gagged in tattered clothing and tied to a pole in what appeared to be a basement. Naturally, when people saw the post, they dialed 911. One caller told the dispatcher that from what they could tell, the intruder had hacked Williams' old Facebook account and that they were threatening to kill her. During the calls, dispatchers could hear Williams' muffled cries in the recordings, including one in which she claimed that someone had cut her throat. Multiple law enforcement agencies initiated a full police response after being made aware of the seemingly dire situation, and a helicopter was even utilized to help aid in the search and rescue mission. In the aftermath of the supposedly harrowing ordeal, Williams reportedly told police that a masked man entered her house during the early morning hours, tied her up, and cut her clothing off. Williams claimed that the intruder then took her phone and used it to record the videos, which he allegedly also posted to her social media account. However, her story unraveled under questioning and police uncovered evidence that Williams had staged her own kidnapping and had taken the photos and videos herself. Butler County Sheriff Richard Jones told local station WESH2 that it appeared as though Williams took several different videos before deciding which one to post. He said that in the footage, investigators could actually see Williams waiting for the camera to start recording before putting on her serious face. Jones further accused her of posting the images from a McDonald's restaurant and described the situation as one of the most bizarre cases his department had ever dealt with. Williams pleaded no contest to charges related to the stage kidnapping, 
and was found guilty of making false alarms. She was given credit for time served after spending 10 days in jail and was subsequently sentenced to a year of probation. Number 8. Kevin McGeever While driving home from a writing class one evening in January 2013, two friends came across a disheveled man along a remote road in Galway, Ireland. The unkempt elderly gentleman, later identified as 68-year-old serial fraudster and con artist Kevin McGeever, claimed he'd been kidnapped. Based on his thin frame and overgrown beard, it certainly seemed believable, but McGeever was nothing other than a lifelong con artist who'd been scamming the system since he was in his 20s. As a matter of fact, it was more or less part of his lifestyle to periodically leave behind an established life in one country, including homes, vehicles, and family, and flee to another country to start his next con. Back in 1973, McGeever had left his expensive Jaguar behind at the Dublin airport, along with a partially built luxury home, and had vanished seemingly into thin air. Twelve years later, in 1985, he left another vehicle at the Sydney airport in Australia and abandoned his wife, two daughters, and a beautiful four-bedroom home that he owned. Fifteen years after that, in 2000, McGeever left his house and cars behind in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and fled to Ireland to avoid facing the FBI over an alleged $8 million fraud scheme. After being found on a roadside in 2013, he claimed that he'd been held captive in an underground container for eight months. He had a cell phone in his possession, which he claimed his abductors had given him when they dumped him off, and it contained the number of a man named John McNevin. McGeever asked the Good Samaritans who picked him up to take him to this McNevin character, but they dropped him off at a police station instead. From there, he was taken to a hospital. Doctors were quick to realize that his eyesight was exceptionally good for someone who claimed they'd spent the better part of a year in darkness. And while he was considerably thin, his muscles didn't appear as though they'd wasted away like one might expect when someone is starved and held captive. It didn't take long for authorities to discover McGeever's real identity and that he was a wanted serial con artist. McGeever claimed that he was being targeted in a case of mistaken identity, but he ultimately pleaded guilty to wasting law enforcement resources and received a two-year suspended sentence as a result. Number 7. Quinn Gray Reed Gray was a successful businessman who was easily able to pay the $25,000 per month mortgage on his family's seaside mansion in Ponta Vedra, Florida. In 2009, he arrived home one day to a troubling note left behind by his wife, Quinn. It claimed that she'd been abducted and instructed Reed to remain at home, to not involve the police, and to cooperate with the kidnapper's demand for a $50,000 ransom. After three days of failed negotiations with the alleged abductors, Quinn appeared in a parking lot, physically uninjured but in a seemingly inconsolable state. She told police that a 25-year-old gas station employee, Jasmine Osmanovich, had held her hostage in a motel room. The motel manager, however, said that he remembered Quinn and that she seemed totally fine during her stay and in no way appeared to be in distress. When detectives questioned Osmanovich, he somehow knew that he'd fall under suspicion and had prepared ahead of time. He arrived at the interview armed with his recordings of his conversations with Quinn, proving that the two were having a steamy affair and that she'd run off with him of her own free will. Osmanovich also admitted that he and Quinn had staged her kidnapping in an attempt to extort Reed Gray. At first, Reed stood by his wife, who continued to insist she had nothing to do with plotting her abduction and continued to play the role of an innocent victim. Even after it became clear that Quinn had at least some knowledge of the kidnapping plot, Reed initially laid most of the blame on Osmanovich and excused Quinn based on her compromised mental state. But as the details of the case continued to unfold, Reed eventually saw the situation for what it was and filed for divorce. In the meantime, Quinn and Osmanovich faced extortion charges in criminal court. In hindsight, it was no surprise that Quinn played a role in the scheme. As an accused serial cheater with an alleged drinking problem, she wasn't exactly wife of the year. 
Sadly, it had to go as far as it did before Reed removed the blinders from his eyes and realized that there was no saving his deeply troubled marriage. Jasmine Osmanovich pleaded guilty to extortion and was sentenced to six months of probation. Quinn Gray pleaded no contest and received seven years of probation. Additionally, the defendants were each ordered to pay $43,000 to cover the cost of taxpayer-funded police resources that were wasted on the fake kidnapping plot. Number 6. Maria Gonzalez while running a trucking business out of California in 2018, 32-year-old Maria Gonzalez found herself unable to pay $9,000 she owed to subcontractors. To avoid paying them, she claimed that she'd been kidnapped, assaulted, and robbed by two African-American men who barged into her vehicle one day when she pulled over to help a pair of loose dogs. The men supposedly ordered Gonzalez to drive to West Fresno at gunpoint. Gonzalez also claimed that she was pistol whipped until she fell unconscious and that she eventually came to in the back seat of her car in a field about 20 miles, 32.2 kilometers, from where she went missing. She was bound, gagged, and robbed of the large amount of money she'd intended to pay her employees with. Police were called after Gonzalez showed up at her neighbor's house, still partially bound. She was taken to the hospital where she began to tell her bizarre story but it seemed like she wanted to make it especially clear, above all, that $9,000 had been stolen from her. Detectives examined video and other evidence and ultimately concluded that Gonzalez lied about her abduction to get out of having to pay the subcontractors. Law enforcement also failed to find any suspicious footprints near Gonzalez's vehicle at the site where she supposedly woke up after being left by her kidnappers, indicating that perhaps they never existed to begin with. Gonzalez also had a rather difficult time explaining how she untied herself enough to get out of the car and seek help. Eventually, she confessed to the ruse and was charged in connection with the wasted police resources that were put into investigating the case. Number 5. Ramel Petway NYPD officers are used to seeing a lot of strange things, but even they were taken aback when they responded to a call and found 36-year-old Ramel Petway bound and gagged along a busy street in Brooklyn, New York. After receiving treatment at a hospital for his alleged injuries, Petway told police that he'd been kidnapped by two men and held captive for two weeks before being dumped on the street where he was found. But the story didn't add up for several reasons. For one, the roll of duct tape that was used to tie Petway up was still hanging from his wrists. As the situation became increasingly suspicious, investigators put the pressure on Petway to come clean. He eventually told the truth, that he'd made up the entire thing because he wanted to get away from his girlfriend for a while. But according to him, she would have never been okay with him disappearing voluntarily. Petway was charged with filing a false police report, and while the outcome of his legal case is unclear, it's safe to assume that the consequences on his personal life constituted ample punishment for his boneheaded actions. Number 4. Dr. Mark Salerno in 2002, a 45-year-old pediatrician named Dr. Mark Salerno was reportedly kidnapped from his home in Phoenix, Arizona. He was found three days later in San Diego when a passerby heard him pounding from the inside of his car trunk. The Good Samaritan called 911 and firefighters used the jaws of life to pry the trunk open and free Dr. Salerno, whose wrists and ankles were bound with duct tape. Salerno told police that three or four men had abducted him and the harrowing story was broadcast on the news. Everything changed, however, when a viewer called authorities and reported seeing Salerno crawl into the trunk and close the lid on his own. Police confronted Salerno, and he allegedly confessed to staging his own abduction to avoid going to court for a criminal case. Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio was less than pleased with the news after using his agency's resources to send a helicopter and other detectives to San Diego to investigate the case. He also said that he planned to send Salerno a bill. A short while later, Salerno was extradited back to Arizona, where he was charged with felony failure to appear in court on a car theft charge. Two weeks before the fake kidnapping, he'd been arrested for driving a car that belonged to a woman who worked for his medical office, who'd reported it stolen a year and a half earlier. The car had a license plate on it that was stolen from another car nearby on the day of Salerno's arrest. His wife and lawyers argued in court that he suffered from depression and financial issues. Later that year, Salerno vanished for three weeks before being found in Pennsylvania 
and sent back to Arizona. He pleaded guilty to one felony count of unlawful use of means of transportation and was ultimately sentenced to three years of probation. After handling his legal issues, Salerno returned to his career and got his life back on track. He eventually became a local celebrity who represented living proof that it's possible to overcome mental illness. In 2018, 16 years after his first two disappearances, Salerno went missing again. Oddly, the media never reported whether he was found, but it was made clear that the doctor's friends and family were concerned for his well-being. Number 3. Jessica Nordquist after moving from Alaska to the United Kingdom to work for an advertising company in 2016, 26-year-old Jessica Nordquist began dating her co-worker, Mark Weeks. The relationship didn't work out, and she apparently couldn't accept that it was over. So she began stalking Weeks online, using as many as 20 different Instagram accounts, and sent messages to her workplace and clients, claiming that Weeks had assaulted her and gotten her pregnant. Nordquist accused the firm of being aware of the assault and brushing it off, and she even bought a fake baby bump on Amazon in an effort to make her claims seem credible. She harassed Weeks and his relatives to the point where he became scared to even sleep in his own home, but he likely never imagined how far she would eventually take things. Weeks ultimately decided to go to the police, who issued Nordquist a warning in early 2017 to stop harassing her victim. Three months later, Weeks and several others, including friends, family, and colleagues of both himself and Weeks, received an email from an alleged crime group claiming they'd abducted Nordquist. Attached to the email were photos of Nordquist naked, gagged, and bound. A secondary email claimed that the kidnappers had broken her fingers. Investigators rushed over to Nordquist's apartment and found a note from the alleged abductors on the door. A few days later, they found the young woman alive and well at a bed and breakfast in the Scottish Highlands. Even after getting caught faking her kidnapping, Nordquist tried to keep up the ruse, claiming in court that she'd been held captive by an MI5 intelligence agent. She was given multiple opportunities to come clean but refused, forcing the case to go to trial and putting Weeks through yet another traumatic ordeal. Not surprisingly, her story didn't hold up, and she was found guilty and given a stiff four-and-a-half-year prison sentence. Number 2. Alejandro Mario Cortez one day in 2018, a snowplow driver spotted a man bound and gagged with duct tape along a roadside in St. Paul, Minnesota. Identified as 46-year-old Alejandro Mario Cortez, the man claimed that he'd been kidnapped from his home in Chicago and taken to St. Paul against his will. He also said that he'd received multiple threatening text messages in the days leading up to the abduction. Authorities called in the FBI, who quickly discovered evidence that Cortez conspired with an accomplice to stage the kidnapping. The pair willingly traveled together from Chicago to Minnesota to carry out the plot. They stayed in a storage facility for several days before the co-conspirator drove Cortez to the site where he was eventually found by the snowplow driver. The accomplice bound his friend and left him there to be discovered. Prosecutors accused Cortez and his friend of staging the abduction in an effort to obtain a visa to stay in the United States. Cortez eventually admitted to the scheme and pleaded guilty to one count of visa fraud and one count of illegally re-entering the US. As a result of his false claims, he'd also received gift cards and other donations from organizations meant to help crime victims get on their feet. By the time Cortez staged the fake kidnapping, he'd been deported from the US twice. While his sentence was never announced, it's likely safe to assume that he was sent back to Mexico for a third time after serving his punishment. Number 1. Brandon Souls in what can only be described as a truly bizarre way to get out of having to go to work, a 19-year-old Arizona man named Brandon Souls allegedly staged his own kidnapping one day in 2021. According to a statement from Coolidge Police, Souls bound his own wrists, gagged himself, and made up an elaborate story because he didn't feel like working his shift at a tire store. It all began one evening when officers responded to a call about an injured man near some railroad tracks who was drifting in and out of consciousness. 
The police arrive to find Souls laying on the ground with his hands bound by a belt and a bandana stuffed in his mouth. He reportedly said that he'd just finished running an errand and returned to his vehicle to find two masked men waiting for him. Souls claimed that one of the men struck him on the back of the head and knocked him unconscious, then drove him to the site where he was found before dumping him there and driving off. He allegedly told investigators that he was abducted because his father had a large amount of money hidden throughout the desert and his captors wanted to know where it was. A week-long investigation ensued, during which detectives failed to find evidence of text messages and phone calls that Souls claimed had taken place. Hospital records revealed that he had no head injuries despite supposedly losing consciousness. After being repeatedly pressured about inconsistencies in his story, Souls allegedly admitted to making the whole thing up, including the part about his dad's hidden treasure. He was charged with false reporting to law enforcement as a result. Would you rather go into witness protection knowing that it meant you'd leave behind almost everyone in your life without explanation, or deal with the embarrassment of being caught staging your own abduction? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye, guys.